Dame Diana Rigg is one of the few actresses to have achieved equal recognition in classical theatre and mainstream TV and movies. Acclaimed in the former for the miracle of her voice in plays including Medea and Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, and in the latter for the miracle of her body as Emma Peel in The Avengers and as 007's love interest in On Her Majesty's Secret Service. Throughout her career, she's alternated high-profile theatre, plays by Tom Stoppard, musicals by Stephen Sondheim, with standout TV, including a BAFTA award-winning role in the domestic drama Mother Love. If we look at other actresses of the same rank, um, Dame Judi Dench, Dame Vanessa Redgrave, Dame Maggie Smith, they've all published an autobiography and or an authorised biography, and we don't have either from you. Is that deliberate policy? Yes. I had a book sent to me uh, at the theatre recently. It's supposed to be my biography. And um, I, I read it with interest, as you can imagine. Um, I had nothing to do with it at all. Uh, and I think I'll stay that way, silent to the grave. And the reason you haven't written your memoirs, where so many of your colleagues have, it is, uh, Paul Schofield, Alec Guinness, said in the past that the public should not know too much about an actor. It should be what's there on stage. Uh, that is what I believe, but also um, it's to do with, with me as a, as a person. Um, I've always hated um, prurience and curiosity about other people. I don't actually have that. And so um, I refuse to play to that in other people. So that is, that's very interesting, but also very unusual. So when it's all, who's this has got the super injunction and who's that is supposed to be going out with so-and-so, you really don't ever get involved in any, any of those games? Well, I got involved with the Daily Mail when they put words into my mouth and, and retired me um, because it was so patently untrue. And it was a question of honour as well that I'd kept my mouth shut about my broken marriage and never talked to any member of the press about it. And suddenly these words were put in my mouth. So yes, I, then I did sue them and um, they came out with their hands up in the end. You were once quoted as saying, I could have gone on to do greater things, but I didn't. Uh, was that an accurate quote? Golly, what was that apropos of? Uh, it was, you were reflecting on your career, I think, about 15, 20 years ago. Oh, isn't that interesting? Yes, I think I was probably talking about the parts. And, and I was obviously uh, mourning the fact that they hadn't come my way. But now, looking back, they did come my way. So I've got no gripes at all in that in that direction. <laughs> but you've had um, an interestingly mixed career. You could, at the beginning, have gone directly down the classical route and played all of those Shakespearean roles, but you've been able to do a huge variety. I was, I was, so I was very lucky and also um, very ignorant uh, because I had absolutely no idea when I went into the and got the Avengers what an impact it would have on my life. I hadn't seen much television. I'd only ever seen uh, television with my parents. So when I took the job, it was a leap in the dark. And I was uh, criticised for it by pe people like Peter Hall, who said she's wasting herself and all that kind of stuff. He'd been your director of the RSC, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, but in actual fact, it worked out wonderfully well. Victorian? I hardly think they'd be amused. No, perhaps not. And women then, well, they lacked your... Independence. I'm thoroughly emancipated. Hmm. Does Elizabethan appeal to you? Not at all. The men were so tiny. The first thing I did when I stopped doing The Avengers was to go back to the Royal Shakespeare and say, thank you, now I can sell tickets, which I couldn't before. And it was my way of... of acknowledging uh, where I had been nurtured. And that question of that range, because people will mention in the Avengers and on Her Majesty's Secret Service, do you regret the shadow of those roles? No, at all. I have to acknowledge what I owe them. And uh, I do acknowledge it. Uh, uh, you know, when, when I leave the theatre now, um, around the stage door, and, you know, we're, we're surrounded by people wanting... And nine times out of ten, it's a photograph of the Avengers or it's a photograph of the Bond film. And I, I acknowledge my debt to those, the film and the series. Uh, it allowed me to do all sorts of other things. 
And as you know, there are some actresses who later on in their careers, as they got older, they've had, retrospectively, they've had feminist concerns about some of the roles they played earlier and some of the things they did and some of the publicity and the legs and the breasts and so on. But have you ever felt concern about the Avengers? Absolutely or... <laughs> not. I mean, uh, the, the feminists actually approached me in, in the 60s, and, you know, to be one of their uh, spokeswomen. And, um, and I, it always seemed to me that the issue is quite simple. Within yourself, you are an individual and you are free. You are a free individual. The only fetters that the feminists have are the economic fetters. And once we have parity with men, which we do in my profession, uh, I've got no gripe at all. And uh, economic uh, independence is what they were about without actually recognizing it. They went on to kind of, you know, chop the cojones off men, which is utterly ridiculous. But the other area that they went into, as you know, is this word objectification, the idea of being a sex object for men. I mean, Emma Peel, I suppose some would say that was, but you, you never worried about that. I, I, it, it, I have to be honest, it discomforted me because I never saw myself as sexy. <laughs> There you go. So um, I, I wasn't entirely happy, but I didn't see it as a feminist issue. I saw it as a, if you like, a, a kind of, I think perhaps I fell short in that respect because I couldn't, I couldn't deliver. I did the sexy photographs because it was asked of me, but I never did the sexy in person, ever, ever, ever. Have you ever worried over the years, because I, there are many stories of actresses getting quite worrying mail from men, I mean, creepy or worse than that, um, have you had that? Oh, yeah, yes, I did, along with a lot of other ladies, mature ladies, and it turned out to be some pathetic creature in Manchester um, who's, I don't know, some bachelor or something, and, and he used to send really filthy things um, to me and... Um, I think Nairi Dawn Porter, various other people suffered. But I could always tell because there was, he had this weird habit of circling, you know, the dot above an eye and he'd circle it. So uh, that was spooky. And as soon as I saw that, I never, I stopped opening them. Well, you had the great advantage of having some eyes in your name. I suppose actresses who didn't, um, they wouldn't have been <laughs> able to work it out right. the, yeah. the yeah. same way. I mean, yeah. two, two, two eyes would be very... Useful. Um, but, it, but in general, uh, fa fans have been, I mean, they've stayed within the right limits. Oh, absolutely. I, de I have no stalking problems. Now, now I don't. When I was doing Phaedra at the National and this Dutchman who, uh, who had a thing about me bought tickets for six nights in a row to see Phaedra, he didn't speak a word of English and he decided that the play was a comedy. <laughs> He sat there laughing <laughs> throughout and, of course, it was very upsetting because there was I trying to be dead serious and tragedian and all that and eventually they had to kick him out and pay him back his, his money. Um, but that was a fan gone wrong. <laughs> That's amazing. So you were playing one of the great tragedies of all Absolutely. time to a, a single going... laughing Dutchman. <laughs> 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 No Turn Unstoned, of which you also know in the book, which was um, yeah. a collection of the worst reviews ever given, um, yeah. after one you received from John Simon, the critic who wrote about you in Abelard and Helwars. Yeah. Did he compare you to a brick mausoleum or to a basilica? Because some people say it was a brick basilica. Oh, I probably got it wrong. Doesn't matter. But insufficient f flying buttresses <laughs> was, <laughs> was the point. <laughs> And you turned it into a very entertaining and very successful book, which has given, I think, a lot of um, performers have been reviewed a lot of pleasure. But um, and Oh, and I do hope uh, courage, mm. because I, it, it's always been uh, um, decided by other people that the reason I wrote the book was to get back at the critics. No, no, no. The reason I wrote the book was to show that everybody, no matter how famous and legendary, has had a bad notice. So courage to the young, because it'll happen to you one of these days, but you can rise above it and you can live beyond it and you can have success beyond it as well. But there is something which is part of the, uh, I, I think, genuine bravery of acting, that whereas if you get a bad review for a film or a TV performance, um, 
you're somewhere else and it can hurt you, but it can't affect you on uh, in, in the performance. On stage, you have to go on night after night knowing of these reviews. Did you just read it yourself, that John Simon review, or did yeah. somebody bring it to your attention? No. No, no, no. Uh... I, I did, yeah. Oh, that was awful. You just opened a newspaper and then... Ah! Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then you sort of duck into doorways on the way, <laughs> on the way to the theatre. Cross your arms across your insufficient flying buttresses. <laughs> <laughs> and did other people comment on it in the no, cast? No, 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 they're charming, you know, people. When, when you've been uh, swinged, as it were, by a critic, nobody mentions anything. Their eyes sort of slide away, so you know they've read it. <laughs> <laughs> and when you had to then go on and do that nude scene again with your, Keith, as, a, as a brick Keith, mausoleum Keith or basilica, Michel. with your insufficient yeah, yeah, flying, flying buttresses. buttresses, did it, um, that must have been difficult to do the well, scene. Well, you've just got to do it. You've got to do it. In fact, um, the, uh, I did a play um, and um, we got the most terrible notices, rightly so. I, 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 it wasn't a good play. And I remember one night up in the, right up in the gods, some man had paid God, not very much because he was in the gods, but he really resented what he'd paid. And, um, and he, he shouted down, this, this play is a load of shit. <laughs> I felt like saying, yeah, I do agree, but I'm sorry <laughs> and I'll pay you back or whatever. Anyway, we just lasted a week. But it is the odd, it is the odd word which can really hurt. And some critics uh, will attack your physicality. I don't think that's fair. But that's what really hurts. You've spoken in the past, I don't know if you still hold to this, about the therapeutic effects of cigarettes and red wine, <laughs> um, which is against official government and yeah, NHS yeah. Um, advice. But do you still... I don't you, smoke now. You've given up? I've given up, yes. And uh, the red wine, I, I fully appreciate. Every doctor will say, you know, have some red wine. It's very good for you. But you said in an interview that you drink a bottle a night to go no, to sleep. No, I didn't. She got it wrong. It was a glass. <laughs> it was a glass. So let's hope not too many people Dear followed the advice God, in, I that, wouldn't um, be here. in that article. It seemed to me um, quite heroic if you were drinking a bottle You're every right. night. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody teased me about that. <laughs> <laughs> so it's one glass of red wine yeah. to, to help you sleep. Yeah, yeah, very good. And why did you um, stop smoking? Uh, because it affected me and I, 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 I had to. I absolutely had to. You know, I'm 73 and I'd had a good spell of thoroughly enjoying cigarettes, but I f f f had to. And your, um, it never seemed in all those years to affect your voice. But didn't. It didn't? No. It's interesting, it really didn't. I mean, I did, I, I did musicals and it, yeah. and it didn't. Was that a leap or had you always been, uh, been aware that you could sing? I've always had this idea that if you're an actor, you should actually be able to do anything. And I've always wanted to do everything. I, I don't want to do mime particularly. Um, I don't want to do anything in a mask. Um, but I did, want to, I did want to sing and dance. I don't think people realise, and I am not a professional singer, I don't think people realise how tough musicals are. They are the toughest form of entertainment on the actors and actresses that do them. You're the top. You're the Colosseum. You're the top. You're the Louvre Museum. You're the nimble tread of the feet of Fred Astaire. You're, You're the National Gallery of Art. Salary are salary <laughs> Camembert. Talking about your childhood, the, the, the two major influences were Yorkshire and India. You were part of that very particular British social group, the Children of the Raj. The reason for that, you, your father, he'd gone to India to work. Yeah, so he was a. An apprentice uh, who'd, who'd won a scholarship and, I, and he, he answered an advertisement in the Times which said only public school boys uh, need apply and it was a Maharaja uh, because in those days they had total power over their kingdoms there and this was uh, Raj Patana, now Rajasthan and um, he, uh, he I think it was, it was a, a designer, one of the famous trains, anyway my father worked under him so obviously he got 
a letter of recommendation. And he came up to London to be interviewed and he got the job and went out to India and built uh, railways for the Maharaja of Jodhpur and Bikaneer. And when I went out with my brother, um, it was so moving. We pitched up in Bikaneer, which is not part of the Golden Triangle, you know, where all the tourists go. Um, Bikaneer is sort of slightly off. And, um, and, and w there were crowds at, at the station and the town band was there. And then a man sang a song in praise of my father, putting bread in the mouths of generations of mothers and children because he started a, a, a train workshop there. And it was so moving to get a, a glimpse of your father's work and, and achievement in life it was wonderful. And the circumstances of that childhood, so they, they would have been servants and you would have had yes. a, a, a nanny. Yes, Aya. Aya. Mm -hmm. uh, and you spoke Hindi? I did, yes. Yeah, I, 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 yes, I spent a lot of time with the Aya. Um, parents were at the tennis club. <laughs> 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 um, yes. And then, of course, I was sent back to England to a boarding school and um, all Hindi disappeared because I wanted to merge and become part of the, 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 the new surroundings. And there are certain qualities associated with Yorkshire people. I can invoke the stereotype because I grew up there, but plain speaking, hard working, a dislike of pretension. Did, did your parents have that? Yeah, all of it. Yeah, it's very much part of our family ethos, totally. And it was a very, which I'm interested in people who've become performers out of this background because to me, a lot of the Northern background was, you weren't supposed to show off. They didn't no. like children showing off, but was that beaten into you? Oh God, yes. I mean, I remember when my parents were abroad and, and I was, school holidays, I lived with my granny who was a tough old Yorkshire broad. I mean, boy, was she tough. And, um, and uh, she used to do Sunday supper, which was always kind of tinned salmon and, beetroot and you know those sad salads that, that existed in those days and I remember I used to get the beetroot and, and put it over my lips and my granny caught me doing it and I got an earful <laughs> about being vain and um, you know stop that immediately so you know that that was very Yorkshire and it, I think it stands you in good stead afterwards because um, you never get too big for your boots. You can't. There's always a voice there saying, who do you think you are? And the fact that you were, you were at school, first of all in Buckinghamshire, and then going, uh, and, and going back to your granny in Yorkshire, so you must have seen very little of your parents at that stage. Yes, I did, yes. Uh, about 18 months I didn't see my mum. And, um, and then she came back and, uh, and there, was a, there was a schism because... Uh, you, I, I, I learned to be independent. Of course you do. You know, w when I went to see my gran, I'd be put on a train uh, from Buckinghamshire to go to Doncaster um, with a label uh, here, Universal Aunts. And I'd get off the platform and, and then some rather, some old spinsterish, joyless person would come and pick me up and walk me around a park and take me to the Cardoma for tea and then put me on a train for Doncaster. So Universal Arms was a kind of guardian service, was it? They are. Yeah. I think they still really exist. Good. And it's very much ladies of, of um, uh, slender means um, uh, and it's very much uh, um, gentility. And this, this kind of upbringing is now not seen as ideal. I mean, it's again, it's gone the other way that it's kind of 24 hour I know. everyday parenting I know. is what well, people I try to do. Well, I never held it against my, my mother or father, yeah. ever, ever, ever. No, I wasn't brought, I mean, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't part of, 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 of thinking in those days. It was for our good. We were sent to school back in England. But do you regret it that you didn't get to know them better? Well, I did get to know them better later on. Uh, I lived with them from 11 onwards. Um, uh, no, I loved them, unquestionably. Uh, we had our, when I was an adolescent, I think I was pretty p painful. <laughs> you know, dying to do other things. I, I lived really quite a, a, an enclosed life with, with just between my parents and school. 
There were, there were no alternatives. There were no youth clubs. There were no discos. There were nothing, nothing at all. And no clothes for, for young girls in those days, no denims. We were dressed as mini adults from a very early age. And the reason you saw more of your parents later on, your, they came back from yeah. India. So your father seems to have been quite a resourceful man because he had to remake his life several times. And first in India and then back yeah. in... Yeah, and he had to come back to, to England and find a job and at an age when it was difficult. Um, yeah, he was. He was a wonderful man, really uh, lovely. I adored him. And then you changed, you were sent to a, another school, which was a Quaker school. Yes, it was, in, Moravian. In Pudsey, as Pudsey. they said, yeah. Pudsey Pudden yet. <laughs> so why did they choose that school, do you know? Well, because I couldn't get into Leeds Grammar. There's no way I could uh, pass the uh, um, test. The 11 plus? The 11 plus, yeah. I was, I, I'd had this very odd education. Um, and, um, a convent in India, where they, I seem to remember they taught me to, do up buttons and laces and stuff. I mean, I, my mother taught me to read. Um, I then came back and went to um, Miss Poskett's in Doncaster, which was, you know, again, gen Yorkshire gentility, but not, not much accent on the education. And then they sat me down in front of a desk to try and get to Leeds uh, Grammar. No way. I mean, I was an intelligent child, but uh, there, was just, there was nothing. I had no formal education. And so they had to send me to a private school. Now, this is interesting because it's commonly said, as you know now, that the problem with the 11 plus was that children who failed it felt a sense of failure. But did you? Oh, of course. Well, apart from anything else, we were not, um, we were quite poor in the sense that they wanted to keep up standards that they'd had in India, but not servants, you understand. But um, yeah, and, and, um, and I was bleeding the family um, accounts the, the, uh, by, by going to a private school. But then to complicate it, you didn't like the, you didn't enjoy the Quaker school. Hated it, yeah. I was very, I was very imaginative and, and uh, there was no very little imagination allowed in that school. It was facts up onto the board, copy them down into your exercise book, go home and learn them. And that was the teaching in those days. Um, except for one teacher called Mrs. Greenwood, who, who uh, uh, actually she taught uh, elocution. A lot of, you know, Yorkshire girls um, had an accent and she taught them how to, how to speak without an accent. But uh, with me, she didn't have to, so we went into poetry, which I loved. And so often in the background of someone, there, there is an inspirational teacher, yeah. but she was, I mean, she was, um, to a, a large degree, responsible for you becoming Very an much actress. So. Yeah. Very much so. And I kept in touch with her right up until, until her death. And when she was doing poetry with you, did, was she clear that she was talking about drama and that she was trying to get you into that area? Yes, she was, oh. yeah. She had all the ambition for me. I, I had no knowledge of theatre at all. And did you do plays at school? Yes, we did. Wild Decembers, the story of the, the Bronte family. Clements Dane, I think it's called. I played uh, Emily, of course, and, and, and coughed through everybody's lines. <laughs> Because she was supposed to be, you were dying of consumption. I was dying of consumption. <laughs> <laughs> Did they tell you to stop coughing? Yes, of course. Oh, right, yeah. Not, and also, I remember putting green powder on my face. It's terribly <laughs> And at what point did the ambition, the idea that you might go to drama school, that was put by Miss Greenwood? Yeah, definitely. And she wrote to Rada. And, um, and then, of course, I was accepted. Um, and, and then I had, we had to find the money. And my dad didn't have the money, so Mrs. Greenwood then wrote to the city council. And um, I had to go and be interviewed by this board of men at the far end of a room, very long walk towards them. And, um, and you know, questions like, well, lass, what makes you think you make, you'll be an actress? You know, sort of kind of like, Anyway, I must have said the right thing because they gave me a scholarship and thank God they did. I mean, I, have, I owe a great deal to that old, old Leeds City Council. Fat chance of anybody getting one nowadays. Having got to Rada, you, you were not one of the stars of the year. No because you didn't, you didn't work hard enough. No, I didn't. 
I didn't, but also I didn't know what quite, I, I knew not of the theatre. I'd just seen two plays, um, um, well, one play twice, Henry VIII. Um, so I didn't, I simply didn't know what I was aiming for. And um, I remember we had a, 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 an old actress called Win Winifred Outen, who'd played Hamlet during the war because they were short of men. And uh, um, she didn't take to me at all. In fact, wrote in, in, in my, my report at the end, I think of my first term, um, I would suggest that Diana seeks out some other form of employment, which of course cut my parents to the quick. Um, and it was awful. Um, but other people believed in me. Uh, Richard Ainley, for example, he was a teacher there as well, and he believed in me. So I kind of squeaked through. And when you, got, when you saw that first term report, mm. were you worried? Yes, of course. I thought, bang goes my, being entirely Yorkshire and, and practical, bang goes my, um, my scholarship, bang goes everything. But luckily, I don't, don't think Leeds City Council saw my report. <laughs> <laughs> And actors are often, even when they're at drama school, they're being shaped into classical or character or comedy. But did you have a sense then of where you would go? I had a sense that, I, uh, very much so, that I was, a, I was a leading lady. Because in those days, the Jews were small, blonde and pretty. And I was none of those things. Um, so uh, forget ever being a Jew of Juliet, forget it. Uh, you're going to have to hang about a bit until you play leading lady roles or character roles. Then you auditioned for the RSC and it's the sort of equivalent to failing the 11 plus in theatre, I suppose, that you didn't get in, but was that crushing? No, because they said, um, a go away. And, and uh, they didn't say no, they said, go away uh, and we'll take you in a year, get some experience, which sort of kind of echoes what I was saying about being at RADA and not knowing quite. So I, they said, we'll take you in a year's time. So you went into what was Weekly Rap, which doesn't, yes. isn't available anymore. No. Um, alas. Chesterfield and York. Well, I was going to, you say alas, lots of actors say this because it was the most, I mean, frightening because you were doing a different play each week, but the most amazing training. Oh, it was wonderful. I, I just adored it, uh, um, Chesterfield. Um, uh, I, I was an ASM playing small parts. Um, an ASM, ASM in, assistant stage manager. Yeah. Assistant stage manager. In those days, um, you, you did everything. You were sent out to get props. Um, you, you were on the book, you were everything. You're a very busy person on sort of a pittance a week. And I adored it. I had such fun. You say one of the tasks of the assistant stage manager was to be on the book or prompt the actors if required. Um, and you are, I think, perhaps the only prompter to have got a review in um, a newspaper. I'm not proud of that <laughs> at all. Uh, yeah, it was the last play of the season and, and actors are very experienced at uh, situations where somebody forgets their lines, they, they help each other out and all that sort of stuff. Well, there I was on the book, the last play of the season. And the, the company were tired and they didn't have a chance for a pause, anything, I leapt in with, with, oh God. And then I got a notice in the local paper and nobody spoke to me again. <laughs> I think it was 72 prompts, is that correct? Oh God, it was something awful. I mean, I didn't think of myself as ambitious at all. I was just trying to be helpful. <laughs> the reviewer said the prompter had such a clear and strong voice that... I should have taken should a curtain call. perhaps have taken a curtain call. Yeah. Oh, just the shame <laughs> You finally joined the RSC, which turned out to be, I mean, almost the perfect time to join because it was when it really took off as a company with Peter Hall and others. Wonderful. It was the last season of Glen Byam Shaw and he was going to go out with a bang. So uh, you name it, that star was there. Charles Lawton was playing Bottom, Olivier was playing Coriolanus, Dame Edith Evans was playing Volumnia and the Countess. Um, uh, Sam Wanamaker was there, Albert Finney was there. Amazing. 
At this stage, you were, think, you were thinking of yourself as a classical actress. Not particularly. I was just grateful to, to get the job and uh, subsequently to be offered a three-year contract because with that three-year contract came singing lessons, fencing lessons, verse speaking lessons. It was absolutely wonderful. You know, they threw their arms around you, uh, proved their belief in you by this three-year contract and then gave you further space and time to develop. Patients are moved. No marvel though she pours. They can be meek but have no other cause. A wretched soul bruised with adversity. We bid be quiet when we hear it cry. But were we burdened with like weight of pain, as much or more we should ourselves complain. So thou that hast no unkind mate to grieve thee, with urging helpless patience would relieve me. Having become established with the RSC, you did um, some television roles, and that led to uh, the Avengers. The approach for that come about? I, I, I was just nominated uh, to audition along with um, half, if not three quarters, of, of the young actresses in London, yes. And um, I, I went along and, and they said, dress, you know, black, black trousers, black um, polo neck and everything. And then they put you in the dressing room and they keep you there for half a day while they, oh, it was just awful. And then, anyway, I, I did it. Um, and Patrick, I remember, was absolutely Patrick charming. Patrick McNee, Patrick yeah. McNee, yeah. And then I got it, I mean, much to my surprise, because I would sort of thought, well, I'd, I'd just go along for the experience, really. And it was slightly unusual because the Avengers already existed, didn't it? And yeah. this, this was a new um, role. Well, it was. T the, 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 there'd been two two other people. Um, it was a man originally, uh, and then they didn't change the script, which is why she was as um, accomplished as she was. Oh, it was no, no. They they now pretend they know what they were doing, but they didn't. Absolutely not. This is really interesting, well, you allude to it there, but there are all these articles and books saying that she was a proto-feminist and yeah. a strong woman, but the part had been written for a man. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And did you, did you know, did you have an easy sense of what you were going to do with the role? I mean, did, did she come easily to you? Yes. Well, particularly, Patrick was very kind, um, uh, and, and that mattered, that we, we clicked, we got on. Uh, we had a sort of same sense of humour and, and uh, so he was instrumental in my easing myself into that part and very quickly feeling at home in it. Because Pat and I quite often would write our own lines. They were very kind and let us sort of improvise and stuff like just to keep it fresh. How do you fare at the Bureau? They took me on, but they seemed more interested in my competitors, so I produced one. Who? You. We're in the travel business. I provide luxurious igloos in Iceland. Complete with a deep freeze. Bare skin rise. And hot and cold running Eskimos. Why not? That's quite an idea. And where do I operate? From your flat. Very convenient. But if you want my opinion... I'd love it, but we have to observe the priorities. And it's hard now to imagine uh, for a lot of people, younger people, how big a TV, what a big TV hit was at that time. Yeah. Because there were only two channels, weren't there? Yeah, so, yeah. Um, therefore, uh, it was, I mean, if something took off, most of the country was, was watching yeah, it. It was huge, yes. And also, the fan mail started pouring in. Well, I didn't have a secretary. I didn't have photographs. I didn't have anything. Nobody, nobody told me or helped me, or, except my mum. <laughs> <laughs> I used to arrive at my mother's house and, you know, with all these things, and I eventually got photographs and, and for the first, well, until the end of the series, it was my mother who did the fan mail. So there are hundreds of photographs out there signed <laughs> by my mother. And she used to answer the mail and, um, you know, there'd be sort of impassioned young men and my mother would write back and say, what you need is a good run round the block. <laughs> And my daughter's far too old for you, and <laughs> stuff like that. On Her Majesty's Secret Service, 1969, um, again, which um, feminists have taken offence on your behalf about this, the idea of being a Bond girl. But oh, that's so silly. <laughs> <laughs> well, there I was. I mean, I did. Um, I didn't ski. I had this very good guy called Willy Bogner doing it for me. But I did drive that car around uh, that rink and loved it, it was great. Poor cameraman was green, as you can imagine, but uh, that was good. 
I know why I did it. I mean, I knew perfectly well why I'd got the job. George Lazenby was was um, ill-equipped. Didn't know he, he, he was a model, male model. So I was there to sort of steer him through and give it some gravitas, um, which I did. That's very interesting. So you thought that they, they had gone for a, a classical actress alongside uh, because a they, male model? Yeah. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. Just to balance it up. And it's entered history not entirely for the right reasons, that uh, film, because a lot of it was regarded at the time by a lot of people as a disappointment or a disaster. It's now one of the most successful, if not the most successful, Bond movie. I don't say that with any great pride, but it, it is. What was the feeling on set about George Lazenby? He was, he was really difficult. It's not for nothing that they didn't offer him any sequels. I mean, he was just difficult because I think he needed help. Not, not in the acting, he was really quite good, wasn't he? And, and attractive and sexy and all those things, but just difficult off stage. Um, he kind of thought he was a film star immediately and started throwing his weight around. And, it was, and then, of course, it was, you know, accused me of eating garlic before love. It was just so petty and ridiculous. I didn't. <laughs> We might as well get that out of the way, but she wrote a newspaper at the time, but it, it's still printed as fact that you of would course. chew garlic before the love chew scenes with him. Chew garlic and, oh, yes, yeah, rubbish. Never did. No. I mean, I, I think I had some chicken liver pate and the thing, which had garlic in it, which, um, silly me, I should have thought of, but I didn't. And um, I could have easily sprayed or whatever. Uh, yes. Poor old George. I don't know what he's doing now, but he, he's definitely um, was the architect of his own demise as a film star. One of the reasons that, it, as you say, it is, it's taken more and more seriously, that film, is that it is a darker film, that one. I mean, there's serious, dramatic mm. uh, stuff to do with the relationship between Bond and the girl. Mm. I mean, it's much less, it was much less a jokey film. Yes, and, and um, quite why the feminists are up in arms about it, I don't know, because uh, the character that I played had a had a central role and was um, not just a piece of fluff. I'll take that, if you don't mind. You're very sure of yourself, aren't you? Suppose I were to kill you for a thrill. I can think of something more sociable to do. <laughs> now, let's stop playing games. Who was that man in your room? You're hurting me. I thought that was the idea tonight. Now, who was he? I don't know what you're talking about. I can be a lot more persuasive, Contessa. I'm sure you can. Whatever else I may be, I'm not a liar. Get dressed. Jumpers, Tom Stoppard play, 1972, yeah. which was another um, very significant role. An unusual role because it, um, it, it involves philosophy, um, philosophical dialogue, um, singing. It's a very unusual play. Did, did it, did it stri strike you immediately as such? Um, I loved Dorothy. I just loved her. Um, married to, to a, a really, really intellectual, clever philosopher. And, um, and she'd been a blues singer. And she was, oh, she's so tender and vulnerable. And at the same time, she spars with her husband. And it's a wonderful play. And the National Theatre this time, where it was, um, Laurence Olivier was in charge and still around. Um, and you had various dealings with him. Now, all, all male actors have a Laurence Olivier impersonation, but do you do, you <laughs> do one? I don't, I don't do a very good one, but I will tell you um, about... Uh, you're not supposed to say the name of the play in a theatre. It's a Scottish play, for those that don't know. Um, I was doing that with Anthony Hopkins, and um, we did a run-through, final run-through, for Sir, as he was known as, um, in the rehearsal room at the, at the Vic. And it was a hot June afternoon, and um, we, 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 we did our rehearsal as best we, we could, you know, da da, sirs out front and give it, give it some welly. And um, at the end of it, nobody said anything, which is odd. And so we all kind of, you know, that we sort of felt a bit flat and, um, and were wandering away. And Sir leant forward and did this to me, and so I, and I thought, well, maybe I'm going to get some notes on, on, on Lady M and, you know, good. 
And he leant forward and he said, you weren't wearing a brassiere during that run through, were you, darling? <laughs> and I went, no. And he went, very disturbing. And that's all he said about my Lady Macbeth, <laughs> which is probably all it deserved, but <laughs> at the time. Um, anyway, we, we had not very good notices and Auntie Hopkins left. One of the critics um, said of him, he played it like a pork butcher from Abergavenny about to tell the stalls a dirty story, whereupon he had a nervous breakdown and left. <laughs> in connection with the not wearing a brassiere in um, Macbeth, Laurence Olivier had, um, according to diaries I've read and accounts, um, he had a, a nickname for you which feminists certainly wouldn't um, have approved of. What was it? Tits rig. He... <laughs> He obviously had a thing about yeah. my tits. Yeah. I didn't know that. Oh, God, that's sweet. <laughs> well, you see, I mean, I, I can't be a feminist because that just makes me laugh. Because, in fact, my tits aren't that big. And, and I'm certainly not known for cleavage. <laughs> well, they impressed um, Sir Lawrence yeah, Olivier. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> After Jumpers, um, a, next, a significant one but less successful was your um, American show, TV show, Diana. Yeah, you were going to be the new, less much less successful. <laughs> it was in that tradition of Mary Tyler yeah, Moore and was. others, that where that, the that, character had the same name as the actress. Exactly, that's what doomed it. <laughs> it was another point of doom for me. Because uh, it was a dead ringer for the Mary Tyler Moore show. And Mary Tyler Moore had been there for years and years and years and was, you know, a, a national treasure. And then along comes this English woman copying very much the formula, and I was doomed. Why, had you, why did you want to do it then? I just wanted to experience everything. I, I, comedy, you know, I've always been... I love comedy. It just makes you feel good. But it shows how high your stock was in America. That was because of um, Avengers and On Her Majesty's Secret Service. Yeah, 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 very much so. But, I mean, it didn't last long. We, we closed after so many weeks. And what was so sweet was um, when I arrived in Hollywood, they sent, you know, the limo. And when I left, they sent the studio wagon. <laughs> <laughs> and was it... Um, you, you laugh about it now, but it, was it depressing to Not be in all. something? Oh, right. Not at all. I came back and, and paid off my mortgage. The Morgan and Wise show, now this is another um, of the turning point roles. It, there isn't really any equivalent now. I mean, to some extent, for a while, Extras was that, which you also appeared in. But there would be this endless speculation about which stars would appear in the um, Morgan and Wise show well, and the Christmas honest, show. Well, to be honest, Glendus kicked it off. She was the one who, who um, started the process of having, you know, star performer to do the play. And uh, good for her, because it, it gave all of us a huge amount of pleasure to do. But that, um, that was sort of a holiday in a way, was it? That was just fun to oh, do. Oh, heaven. Ha, 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 how could you believe me? Yeah, it's just great. And they were fun to, to play with as well. Although they took it pretty seriously, Eric and Annie. I mean, they I, worked all year on those things. Absolutely. I mean, no, no mucking about. But what was so good about it was that it was highly professional, but that it had this icing of fun on top. <laughs> Charlie, Charlie, sweetheart. Yes. Am I really your very own sweet Nell? Positively. And you don't have another? Not to my knowledge, no. <laughs> I sent off for one, but they haven't returned it yet. <laughs> Too busy to see me. Good Lord, never. Will I be interfering with His Majesty's obligations? I sincerely hope so. <laughs> Two other very important roles, The Misanthrope and Fedra Britannica, mm. which were both verse translations by Tony Harrison. Um, and Fedra Britannica it took you ba literally back to your roots because he took that play and he set it in yeah, the Yeah, I didn't Raj. work because of that. Ah. Uh, it simply, I mean, also because I was not prepared. I wasn't good. End of story. I'm interested that you can look back so clearly and say that didn't work. I mean, can you in general do that with oh, your Oh, yeah, I, I can tell you which, which plays I was good in and which plays I wasn't and why, nine times out of ten. I mean, you've got to. What's the point? You've got to learn from, from your mistakes. OK, well, so tell us some others that didn't work then. Um, other things, I did an adaptation of Hedda Gabler for ITV um, and that was not very good. It was by John Osborne. And then they cut it down. So it ended up like a French farce with people coming in and out of the doors and there, and then suddenly, bang, end of play. You make me afraid, Hedda. Tea is laid in the dining room. 
Mum. Good. We're coming. No, no, I'd rather go home alone now, straight oh, away. What a way to talk. First, you're going to have some tea, you little mad thing, you. And then at 10 o'clock, Eilert Loveborg will be back. With wine and roses. I wasn't good in that. I wasn't good in hay fever at the, uh, at the Chichester. I wasn't good in uh, the cherry orchard at Chichester. Do you know from early on in these cases that... You're not going to be good? Yeah. <laughs> no. No. You try your best. You do your best. But um, I j it, it's, it's interesting. Um, you can make all sorts of excuses, and I'm not about to go into that. But I do think, in the end, you've got to be honest with yourself, completely and utterly honest, and say, I did not serve that play. And is it, is it miscasting, or you just can't, as no, they say, you're not feeling well. it? I just wasn't feeling it. I just wasn't there. And I should have been. So, you say, I was, you say sorry to the public. <laughs> <laughs> and how much is it connected with uh, what's going on in the rest of your life? I mean, can you oh, override that? It is. Quite a lot, yeah. Um, yes, I wasn't terribly, terribly well during hay fever and uh, um, my joie de vivre wasn't there. And the ones where it has worked, or at least it has the public, if we take, for example, Tom Stoppard's Night and Day, it ran for a long time and yeah. you got good notices. With, with that one, did you think that one had worked? I knew her. It's the difference. I knew her and I had absolutely no problem at all. Um, and, and that's what happens uh, more often than not with me. I can't speak for other people, but you read the script. Sarah Bernhardt said, I look, I look over the part to see if it is in nature. And if it is, then I know it can be played. Isn't that wonderful? Mm. And that's more or less if it's in my nature or if, it's, if, it's in, uh, if it is a nature that I understand, then I can play it. Follies, um, Stephen Sondheim, West mm. End, 1987, I think. Um, you had one of the most complicated lyrics, I think, ever written. It, yeah. Can you remember it still? No. I can do it for you, I hope. <laughs> in the depths of her interior were fears she was inferior and something even eerier, but no one dared to query her superior exterior. Yeah. Which is an astonishing bit of lyric writing, even by the standards of... Um, Stephen. Stephen Sondheim, but on the other hand, you have to learn it and sing it. Huh? Yeah, and he actually did write it for me, mm. and it actually speaks vols about me. He's, he's a very astute man, Stephen. Ah, oh, now this is intriguing because it wasn't it wasn't in the first version of Follies, as no. you say. He put it in for you. Yeah, and it's this woman who feels up front and yeah. a bit trembly inside. Inside, and yeah. that's you. Yeah, a bit. She also feels she has to put on a show. Yeah, for, yeah, um, very much so other people yeah. yeah and you feel that well not always as i get older I, that kind of drops but you know th th there is a sort of there is an expectation of you when you've been around as long as i have uh that you're going to that you 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 you, you there's a sort of degree of oh amuse me um entertain me um be be the person that i i thought you would be in my imagination do you see what i'm mm. talking about then television um, and theatre, there are a series of... You got into a very nice run, I think, of kind of monster roles of various kinds, <laughs> of, um, of, of villainesses of various degrees, or, or at least dark characters. So um, we, have, uh, we have Bleak House, we have uh, Mrs Danvers and Rebecca, we have Mother Love, which the Andrew Davis adapted from a novel. Those are clearly... I mean, there's something there for an actress to get hold of if you have that degree of darkness. They're wonderful parts to play. Uh, um, yes, it's it's. Uh, some people can't. Some people find it difficult to get in touch with the darkness. I don't. Um, maybe <laughs> I don't know. I mean, maybe I've got capacity for evil inside me. I don't, I don't know. I've never done anything evil. I don't think. But uh, I do. I do understand evil. I understand the desire for evil. But in Mother Love, I mean, she is an, a, a quite satanic figure, this woman who has such an obsessive relationship with her son that she tries to control him yes. in, in every way, but you understood her. Completely. She disguises everything, but it is, it is of course, it, it's Oedipal, it's jealousy, 
Uh, and we all understand jealousy, but it's jealousy to, 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 to such a degree that, of course, it becomes uh, maniacal. Uh, and, um, and, and I see how jealousy can, can build. I see how she does little things and they succeed and then she does something even greater. And then she contemplates the, the ultimate, which is killing. Um, the point about playing a character like that is that you have to, it's a bit like Jaws, you have to just see the tail cutting through the water. You can't actually exit the water. Uh, you have to keep just things suggested all the way through. You're like me. We feel very, very deeply. Our love once given is absolute. We know what is right, even when people laugh at it. I don't think anyone laughs at it, Helena. You see, I have known betrayal of the worst kind. Kit's father was cruel and unnatural. He behaved like a monster toward Kit and me. And for better or for worse, I have protected my son against that knowledge. Do you understand? When a role is well known and other people have played it, for example, Mrs. Danvers and Rebecca or Lady Dedlock in Bleak House, do you try to put other people's interpretations out of your mind and just try to start? Well, I think you've got to. Um, the thing about Mrs Danvers was that I, I wanted to show that she was trapped in a, in a juvenile admiration and love for Rebecca. And um, she'd, known Rebecca, she'd known Rebecca as a child and I assumed that Mrs Danvers was not married because all, all, all the housekeepers used to be called Mrs, whether they were married or not. And then I had this hair uh, with a hair clip which is very schoolgirlish, and and uh, and th that I hope represented what was, and 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 in her heart as well, um, pathetic, and dangerous. Laurence Olivier famously liked to get the externals right. He mm. said if he got the shoes right mm. and the glasses and the hair. But do, do you I like to do? I don't work that way normally. It's the first time I've actually d done it with Mrs. Danvers. You know, and I just I thought that'll help. And also, you, you try and find out um, the circumstances under which the script was written. You find out about the writer because all of that feeds into your interpretation. It's not just a play. It's, it's, it's an aspect of humanity at a specific time in history, all of which matters. You wouldn't think she was dead, would you? I feel her everywhere. So do you, don't you? I hear her footsteps behind me, or the sound of her dress sweeping the stairs as she comes down to dinner. Do you think the dead come back to watch the living? Is she watching us now? No. I don't know, no. Does she watch you and Mr. De Winter together? But when you have a living playwright there, do you, would you ask them a lot, why oh, does God, she yes. say this, why does she oh, say yeah. that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yes, very much so. Sometimes they get tetchy. <laughs> Go on, tell us who. No, 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 I wouldn't dream of it. But, but sometimes the um, response is, oh, well, of course. Do you see what I mean? I mean, I did Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf and the playwright was there. Edward Albee. Edward Albee was there. And we, we did turn to him and I, I, it was quite interesting because David Suchet asked him a lot of questions and, and he treated David, I thought, uh, dismissively and I, I didn't like that so I didn't ask questions and went ahead and did my own thing and then of course learnt afterwards that he thoroughly disapproved of my performance so there you go. <laughs> <laughs> but um, Albie famously doesn't like to answer questions from actors he just wants no, the script to be there. No but why be there mm. if, if you're not going to answer questions because he's the fount after all and, um, and I didn't understand that. I mean surely there has to be a collaboration and you have to help the actor realize what you have written. I'm loud and I'm vulgar 
and I wear the pants in this house because somebody's got to, but I'm not a monster, I am not. You're a spoiled, self-indulgent, willful, dirty-minded, liquor-ridden... Snap! It went snap. Look, I'm not gonna try to get through to you anymore. I'm not gonna try. And that was um, part of a run of, I mean, really powerful theatre roles that you got. Um, Medea, Mother Courage, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, um, at the Almeida. And that went against what a lot of people believe, that the roles get harder to find. But you had really quite a theatrical renaissance with I that did. I run. was very lucky because I came across, well, Jonathan Kent, who um, saw that I was working in this perfectly dreadful play <laughs> at the Royal Court, Howard Brenton, I forget what it was called. Blessedly. Oh, it was called um, Berlin Bertie. Oh, well, that, there's a mess of pottage. Anyway, that's another failure. And I couldn't learn from that at all. So I look upon it as dead and buried failure. Um, and then Jonathan saw that I was playing there and thought, oh, she, she'll play venues other than the West End. And thank God approached me to do All for Love and then started our collaboration. And um, courtesy of Jonathan, to whom I owe a very great deal, I played some wonderful parts. There's a lot of talk about the roles getting much harder to find for women in particular as they get older. I mean, do, did you find that? Well, I didn't, courtesy of Jonathan, because he kept on thinking of things for me to do. Um, uh, and so suddenly, at, 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 at the ripe old age, I think it was around about 50, that I just one thing after the other. And of course, you, with that, you grow. You won three London Evening Standard Best Actress Awards in the space of, I mean, less than a decade. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. But anyway, it's, it's, it is wonderful. And I was very, very lucky. Um, you know, that, that, that mm, you, you begin to think of yourself as this old hat has been. And, um, and that, of course, uh, uh, infuses your work. But I was learning at a time when most learning stops. But it is famously more difficult for women because whereas men have, say, in Shakespeare, they have that clear set They've of got roles. Leah, yeah. Leah to come, uh, Prospero, Leah, all mm, of those. Mm. There's, I mean, women only really have the Countess in All's Well That Ends Well, mm. don't they? And then they have to look elsewhere, Chekhov. But they just aren't the same number of signature roles. No. So you just have to Until look elsewhere. Until somebody writes mm. something, you know? I saw life in the theatre and I thought, oh, that's so interesting. The David Mamet play? Yeah, why doesn't he do life in the theatre for an actress? Ah, because that play is about actors, yeah. Yeah, well, you can do it for an actress. Mm. It's very mm. interesting, equally interesting, rather more interesting, in fact, because an actress's emotional life is so imbued with, with, with family and lovers and husbands and all that kind of stuff. And television and movies, even more than theatre, have been accused of ignoring older actresses, but do you feel that? Uh, no. I mean, I don't do much work on television and I certainly do, don't do much work on film. Um, but I, I can't... I, I'm, I'm a very lucky woman, I cannot complain. All the things, the things that matter to me most is theatre. And I have had a, an absolutely God-given chances in theatre, some of which I've taken, some of which I've failed at, but for the most part, I have absolutely no regrets at all. Dame Diana Rigg, thank you very much. Thank you.